Strap yourself in. Woodwork for Hippin. Not available in the state of shop. Hey everybody, Dan Schinder here on Drum Talk TV here with a guest who actually could cross over into our Session Masters series, but this is the Performance Masters series with Brent Fitz. How are you? I'm good. Good. Thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. Thanks for wearing your drummer shoes. They're, they are a standard issue yeah, they when it comes are. to drummers. They're very comfortable. Um, you've done so many things, Brent, not just playing live, but you've done a lot of session work too. Let's start with that. We'll kind of skip around the timeline if that's okay. I've done more session work more recently, but yeah. actually it, back in my, you know, my youth, it was all about playing live yeah. for years and years and years. And then more so lately in the last 10 years, I've gotten to, to do a lot more session stuff. But right. um, yeah, I guess I'm trying to like juggle a bit of both, mm -hmm. be a live player and be a session player. And um, two different animals, two different mentalities, I think, you know, trying to accomplish yourself as a good uh, live performer is a whole different, you know, set of, of rules and, and goals and stuff. And then I, I didn't know that to be a good session player, it would be advantageous to be also a good live player. But right. so anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to um, be a well-rounded musician. So I think some players are great at, you know, just being session guys and, and some guys are... Um, are really good live players. So if I'm able to have a little bit of both in, in my in my uh, my career, then I think I'm you know fulfilling those yeah those dreams. Yeah, and I was going to ask, how does your live performing skills affect your session playing skills, and how do your session playing skills affect your live playing skills? How much do they cross over when you call on one area for the other? <laughs> when I was young, I wanted to get in front of people and play. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, just right. have an audience and, yeah. and get to play in front of people. But I think I, I overplayed and I got that out of my system. Although I, I overplayed a lot in my basement playing along to my favorite, favorite right. Rush records. And when you say overplay, you don't mean too often. You mean physically doing all the big fills and, I just and wanted more to get, intricate music, stuff like that. Yeah, I just okay. wanted to make sure I got all those extra notes in. Yeah. Because, you know, as when you're younger, it's, you're trying to figure things out. So yeah. I just noticed as I got older, that I started to play a little bit more um, mature and for the song. And I think mm -hmm. that helped later on as becoming a session player is to be real intuitive to what's important for that particular song, you know, you're working on at the time. And overplaying is probably not the best um, attribute as a session player, unless it's right. called for. But I always feel like I, my heroes as, as drummers, especially session guys, were always, you know, real um, intuitive to just playing t for a song and... Uh, um, Being able to take direction too, right? Yeah, I mean, you just have to be, it's, a, uh, um, it's more about working with other people and not just being an individual. And I mm -hmm. thought early on when I was playing in front of people as a, you know, a young kid in my, I started touring, playing in front of, you know, audiences at like 16, playing mm -hmm. bars, you know, underage. And, and those times was a little bit more about, I, I liked playing with people, mm -hmm. and I liked playing in a band, but I also was, you know, for me, I was like, man, you know, I, I just want to make sure that I'm, when you're the drummer, and you, you know, you want to get all your little drum licks in, and now I just realized that years later, I've, you know, I've tapered off on, on all that, yeah. and, and uh, but I learned that from playing a lot of live gigs. Mm -hmm. That was some of the, the, the um, the uh, lesson learned as a, right. as a session guy. So when it finally came time, to, you know, which was a privilege to get to actually play on, on you know, recordings, it, there's a big difference from, you know, playing in front of people and, and having, you know, the chance to, uh, to perform live, but to actually play on records and make yeah. some, some sort of a statement is a whole other, you know, thing that's working that's, under the direction of a producer and whoever's band it is and things like that. Yeah, it, to play. it's a whole other appreciation. So, um, yeah, yeah I've, I've just, um, you know, spent time trying to figure out how every time I make a recording, mm -hmm. how do I better myself on the next recording? And, right. uh, you know, I started to make more proper records when I moved to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I'd done a lot of touring in Canada and a lot of live touring, but not a lot of as much recording. And then when I got to LA and, you know, got under the, uh, you know, a big city like LA is, you know, pretty intimidating. There's a lot of great players. So mm -hmm. that, was, that was where I got my, my feet wet, you know, doing a lot of recording in big studios. And, and I had to, to figure that out pretty quickly. But I had, you know, um, I have a little something I, I didn't tell you about ahead of time. Right. I just wanted to sh uh, um, introduce something that sure. I actually brought from Canada that I had on my oh, wall cool. as a kid. And it's funny that we're talking about studio drummers, but, yeah. um, you know, I loved probably, we probably had a lot of the same drum heroes growing up. I loved 
of course, you know, John Bonham was a big right. rock drummer I've influence. Heard of him. <laughs> haven't we all? And Neil Peart was, you know, yeah. great. And um, yeah. and I loved like bands like Kiss and Cheap Trick and a lot of those Beatle type bands. And, yeah. And Ian um, Pace, Are you an Ian Pace fan. Deep love Purple? Ian Pace. I actually yeah. liked Ian Pace more than I liked Bonham early on. Uh -huh. I thought he had great rudiments and yeah, and uh, that jazz influence he brought into the music. And yeah. So I actually was more of, uh, uh, a fan of him of him before I got into um, John Bonham, ironically. So, mm -hmm. um, but then. I was also into some other heroes that weren't quite, you know, like all the kids in my neighborhood that were growing up listening to Kiss and Van Halen and stuff. But I, you know, I had my modern drummer magazines early on as a kid and, and I got all my drum heroes out of those magazines. So right. even though I had posters of, you know, all those rock heroes back in the day, I also had a poster on my wall, which I just brought home from, from my parents' place in Canada. It's oh, kind wow, of funny, but um, check this out. Oh, nice. So is that cool? Yeah. So I had a poster of Jeff Beccaro Jeff on my Beccaro, wall. Jeff Beccaro, yeah. And he's always sort of been my benchmark as like a, you know, a studio. He's, yeah. he's my favorite drummer. Who also played great live. Played you great know, live, both, too. Both sides, yeah. But, um, and so I, he's your biggest influence, your biggest hero, you think? Yeah, I, I would yeah. say as, a, as an beautiful. overall drummer, I mm -hmm. think he covered. Because he's a well Bonham rounded. fan, too. Yeah. And, and, uh, and you know really introduced me to like guys like Bernard Purdy mm -hmm. and you know a lot of his influences were not it was certainly not just rock so yeah. it, it gave me a chance to appreciate other styles of music too so I kind of lived vicariously through him and I'm still you know discovering him over and over and over yeah. so that's really cool because one of the things I don't do it on every episode but if you follow this show and if you don't you'll learn now um, and if you don't what's wrong but anyways if you do Thanks for having the forum to, uh, to sure. have drum talk. You know, it's cool. Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. It's, it's, we love it because we do get to talk about not just the obvious stuff, but one of my favorite questions to ask is who, well, before I ask it all, I'll kind of paint the picture. We all have drum heroes and each of those drum heroes typically are not so much like Jeff. They're very um, stereotypical typed into the bands we know them from. Like when you think of Nico McBrain, what do you think of? You think of heavy metal, progressive metal, Iron Maiden, when you think of uh, John Bonham or Bill Ward or whatever, we, you know. Mm -hmm. So I like to ask someone like yourself who's playing with Slash right now uh, that denotes a certain style of music. I love asking who are some of your influences that are totally outside of the genre that you're known from? You know, I love asking that question because I think there's a big lesson in that. One of them, of course, you just pointed out was Jeff. Um, well, I grew up playing piano, too. Oh, great. Which is really cool that my parents, you know, forced me, not forcibly, but early on, you know, they, they um, introduced me to piano lessons at like five years old. Mm -hmm. That later on was a great thing that kind of helped me round out my musical vocabulary. And as a drummer, you know, it, I think it what has helped me now is I appreciate the musician, the drummer that's a musician. Right. So I love um, Phil Collin. Mm -hmm. I love, uh, well, Dave Grohl is like the new, awesome, well-rounded guy that's, you know, right. such a great drummer, but, you know, just a great musician. musician but yeah. I always loved drummers that played other instruments. Don Henley, uh -huh. you know, great singer. And, yeah. and uh, so I think um, some of my heroes are, are those, those drummers that are like, they're musicians. They're not mm -hmm. just the... The typical drummer drummers. I mean, I love all this. We all have the same guys. We, everyone's, you know, gone through a Neil Peart phase or or mm -hmm. uh, a Buddy Rich um, phase. And right. I would say Buddy Rich is probably the best. You know, that guy's from another planet. Yeah. Best yeah. drummer ever, and still to this day. But uh, so I and you know I took lessons early on when mm -hmm. I was probably about ten, and that that teacher sort of turned me on to a lot of drummers that I wouldn't have ever discovered because... Wait, let me ask you, what kind of music were you in when you started taking lessons and then what did he spin you out to that opened your mind musically? Well, um, maybe some of the, what the kids at school, we were all like my friends in the neighborhood, you know, we all wanted to be Van Halen and right. Kiss and Cheap yes. Trick and, and those rock bands. And then the, the teacher, you know, was like, well, those are cool. I love those, those bands too, but, and he was, um, I got to learn from a father and son team. Mm -hmm. So the son was a few years older than me, and he was definitely into rock and, you know, cool drummers, um, Billy Cobham and stuff yeah. like that. Oh, cool. And, uh, and then the, the, the dad got me into all the Gene Krupa and the, you know, everything that was something I wouldn't have necessarily discovered on my own unless, an, uh, you know, an adult had maybe influenced me. And, yeah. and I, I wouldn't have necessarily been turned on to certain stuff by my parents because my parents had a lot of... Um, 
uh, music. Like they had some Beatles records, but they had a lot of um, Liberace and stuff like that, which oh, was, you wow. know, but as a piano player, that was cool. Yeah. So I, I, I always, you know, Elton John and stuff like that. So right. again, I always got a little bit of the piano side and the and then the drum side as well. So, That's but cool. uh, yeah, I got introduced to some cool stuff through like a, a you know, a music teacher early yeah. on, so. That's great. I kind of went through the same phase where sort of backwards when I was young and starting to play, I didn't know there were different styles of music because back then, and we're about the same age, there was this AM radio station that didn't play rock music or funk or blues, it played music. Yeah. So at seven, eight, nine years old, I had headphones on, on a stereo where the chord would reach. And on this channel, if you grew up in LA, 93 KHJ, one song would be Steppenwolf, the next song would be Neil Diamond, then you'd hear Pat Boone, The Fifth Dimension, The Beatles, Led Zeppelin, Rolling Stones, Ohio yeah. Players. So I just played to whatever came on, not understanding the way it is now, whereas styles are so segregated onto that channel for that market, whatever they say that is. You yeah. know, It's so different, so I, I kind of, learned early on how to stay open-minded to different styles and everything. And that's also why I like asking that question so much on the show. Who are some of your idols and influences that people might be surprised by? Because again, I think there's a big lesson in that. Oh, know? and and the eight track was the most influential device for me back in the day yeah. because, and if you were from our era, you would know what an eight track is. And if right. you don't, then I'll explain it. But the fact that when you put in the eight track into the player, mm -hmm. those four programs, you were, there was not as, it wasn't advanced to fast forward, like, you know, kids now can just, you know, right. fast forward through any sort of MP3s, and if you're bored of something, you, you just get rid of it. Yeah. But back in those days, we would, um, my parents bought me this, like, some sort of rock 80 thing, and it was like a, a compilation of a bunch of music that was popular in 1980 or something, at the time, hits. And, mm -hmm. and I'd put that in, I would just play along to all those songs, you know, in, in my... in my Because uh, you have to listen to the whole thing. Yeah, so I was like, oh, cool, I can't wait to play to this Rush song, and this you know, I don't know, it'd be Rick Springfield or April Wine, and then there'd be like Juice Newton. I'd be like, mm, but okay, you know, and I would just yeah. play along to whatever was popular back then and right. could have been country rock or, or uh, so I'm just glad that, you know, you don't think about those things when you're 10, 15 years old. And then yeah. here we are in our, our little older our blanks. Yeah. And uh, all of a sudden <laughs> it's like, I'm just glad that I got exposed to all those things by accident right. or maybe by purpose or whatever, but uh, yeah. certainly helps, you know, make you a, a better musician. Right. Can you talk about the project you're working on now? Sure. Well, I'm like several years into um, working with Slash in a, in a, in a not-so-new band anymore, but right. I, I, um, I've been working with him since about 2010, and we're, we're 2014 now, so right. um, I had done many, many gigs previous to working with him that probably introduced me through some other connection mm -hmm. to, um, to eventually uh, he was putting a new band together a few years back and wanted to uh, to go out on the road and and um, so someone had recommended me for that gig, which so was the musical six degrees of separation paid off for you. It's uh, I I I swear by it. Yeah. You know things I did 20 years ago, people I met, things I had done, gigs or whatever, all have factored into what happens today and and right. will happen tomorrow. So yeah, some sort of you know thing worked out that, that that it was really cool he gave me a call and he was putting a new band together and i wasn't actually doing something that was super committed that i couldn't you know get involved with him so mm -hmm. yeah so we've actually um toured a bunch we've toured a few continents uh That's now great. over the years and we um were lucky enough to make a, a record together and we're already on our second record together so right. we're, we're just in the middle of that right now which is cool so great. I've just finished doing a whole bunch of drum tracks in LA and, and I've just come home to sort of decompress here in Vegas and, and I'm still working on, you know, I'll be playing some percussion and some different things on the record. Cool. Again, some cool things that are I get to do now that, um, you know, when I was younger, I, I, I never thought about, you know, playing percussion on a record either. And, right. I, and I, you know, playing a little bit of piano here and there, some organ on, on different songs. So I love doing all that. The percussion cool. side is a whole thing that, you know, you play drums forever and then you don't think about, well, oh, tambourine. Yeah. You know, maracas and percussion, they, yeah. they add a whole other different dimension. Different layers, yeah, the textures and the rhythms are different. You know, they're all over our favorite records. If you don't right. even think about them, they're on Beatles records and Stones mm -hmm. and all those great ones. And, yeah. and Genesis, uh, yes, even progressive rock has tambourines and claves and castanets even on a yes. Triangle. Yeah. Sure. Ding. 
<laughs> yeah, it's all cool. Yeah, so. absolutely. That's cool. That must be fun. What's it like? This is a dorky sort of obvious question, but I got to ask because a lot of us want to know, what's it like working with Slash? Well, he's the most um, inspirational player I've ever played with. Really? And I think um, part of it is the fact that he's been so revered and successful, mm -hmm. but yet he's, he's the hardest on himself and uh, he's really inspirational to be around so you know to be around a guy who's already had lots of success but yet challenges himself and then it sort of rubs off yeah. on us as players so rather than working with someone who lets it rest on the rest yeah. on their laurels and they're just mailing it in it's not like that at all with him is it it isn't and, and you know we're just trying to you know make good music and, and go out mm -hmm. and play shows and everybody in the band sort of on the same page it's a bit of a been there done that mentality and you know um, we just love playing, and Great. that never goes away as a musician. But you know, right. sometimes you get distracted by other, you know, vices and stuff. And then, um, but this band has sort of come together at a good, good place in everybody's careers, and, yeah. and uh, so it's, it's just a cool band to be in. You know, everybody in the band's really on their own, super talented, and, mm -hmm. and Slash, I think, even feels that in his, you know, as far as like bettering himself, because the other players in the band are all That's you know, cool. established as well. So yeah, it's a. It's a pretty cool, uh, it's a pretty cool band to be in right yeah. now. Do you know when the CD comes out and you guys will tour it? Yeah, um, it's probably going to be months from now. It's like summertime. Okay. And this release. is March. Whenever you're watching, this is mid March, two four, 2014. Yeah, it'll, it'll take a little bit to um, you know finish. We're we're just in a stage of you know getting guitars and vocals on the record, mm -hmm. and then um, you know it takes some time to mix a record. That'll all get done, and um, then they, you know, the setup to, to going on tour is, is uh, you know, summertime. I'm, I'm dying to get on the road. So is Slash. We're all That's live cool. players. Yeah, absolutely. As great as it is to record a record, it's, it's even greater to go out and tour the thing. That, Present you know, it. Yeah it's, yeah, it's it's like the best of both because, like I said years ago, when I just played other people's music in front of an audience, and then to go and you know have the the luxury and the privilege to go and make your own music with other people, and then go and perform that stuff live is, I mean, it's none, nothing yeah, better, so. That's great. We were talking earlier before we started rolling the cameras about um, the whole concept, and it's more than a concept of how being in the arts and being a musician um, specifically as it relates to us keeps you young yeah. and everything. And what's, what's interesting is that a lot of our idols are doing exactly what they were doing 30, 40 years ago. And now they're in their at least late 50s, some of them early to late 60s, and a few of them even in their 70s. Yeah. And they're still doing what they were doing, literally, you know, way back then in the 60s and 70s. Um, how has that affected your life? Like, did you, and you don't have to say your age if you want to, that's fine. I'm 43. Okay, he's 43. So let's give that a reference. So you're 43, only a year younger than me. Just kidding. Um, did you ever think when you were 15, 16, 17, starting to play gigs and bars that you'd be 43 in your mid 40s doing what you're doing still and doing it professionally and probably having a long way to go still? Did it ever occur to you that way back then? It probably occurred to me early on that I wanted to be a musician. Well, it didn't probably. I knew in my, you know, probably seven or eight years old what I wanted to do in life. And it was right. just having that. Um, I guess a lot of people around me, you know, kids growing up in my, you know, around me in my neighborhood, you know, I don't know if everyone knew what they wanted to do, but I just always felt I knew that I wanted to play music. Yeah. And my parents probably supported it, but didn't necessarily understand, well, how does that become a career? You know, I think my dad wanted me, he would have preferred me to be a dentist at first. Mm -hmm. But, you know, since then, it's obviously things have kind of worked out that I've found a way to, the hardest thing is to figure a way to make a living playing your yeah. instrument. That's the hardest thing. Yeah. So... Early on, it was just the love for, you know, bands that I listened to growing up and then wanted to emulate that mm -hmm. and, you know, appreciating music more as a, as a player because I had teachers who taught me how to, you know, be a better musician and have better vocabulary and, and whatnot. And then just as I realized playing in front of people and performing how good that made me feel and made other people feel, and then to be creative and mm -hmm. make your own music as well and leave sort of like a stamp, you know, of, of you know, it's one thing to, to play live and then that's, it's over, but to actually you know, create music and have it uh, you know, a lasting effect by making you know, records and stuff. Right. So, and at 43, I guess it's just like careful what you wish for. Yeah, exactly. It all just cul culminated into like, well, I'm just glad I'm still doing it because yeah. I haven't really thought about it, but mm -hmm. at some point I've worked with 
um, Alice Cooper yeah. and some other... The Guess Who. The Guess Who, you know, um, one of the, uh, my good friends in The Guess Who, I think he just turned 70 recently, and I just yeah. look at, at the, you know, someone who's that age and is still playing music, and I'm just, I'm looking forward to like, yeah. wow, it must be cool. To it's like being in a band with your dad. Well, yeah. <laughs> Age-wise. Who, who's cooler and has more rock and roll stories. Yeah. But... Um, <laughs> You know what I'm saying. Yeah, it's just, it's, yeah I totally get it. It's got to yeah. be cool to have, you know, 40, 50 years of a music career behind yeah. you to look back at and reflect and, yeah. and still be doing that. So, Absolutely. yeah, I mean, I've just rubbed uh, th all those great players that I've worked with have kind of rubbed off on me. And, yeah. and uh, so I just hope to be a, a great player, you know, down the road as well. Yeah. So I read something that I want to ask you about before we jump into one of the coolest parts of the show, and that's geeking out on gear. Are but we going to play? But, oh, and we'll play, too. We got a little surprise for you at the end, too, because right. there's a real cool percussion rig over here that I'm going to jump on while Brent Do we want to talk about where we are real quick? Yeah, we can do that. Absolutely. Talk Let's about that, and then I'll ask you this other question. Go for okay, it. Okay, real quick. So we're at um, a good friend of mine's place, which is Benson Productions here, and this is like the and coolest. And we're in Vegas. We're both Vegas residents. That's how we met. Yeah, yeah. Um, and our, my dear friend Benoit's place here is... I mean, it's the coolest place in town. It's like state-of-the-art This is hang, cool. drum hang, music hang. There's a great percussion rig here. I've brought my drums off tour, set them up here off, um, you know, while I'm off the road, I can still come here and, and, and jam, and, and uh, it's great here. So. And just to say, Brent sent me a link, because I said, hey, do you have any pictures of the place so I know what to bring? And he sent this link that's like what a realtor would have. It's a 360-degree thing where you just drag the thing, and it looks around the whole room like, wow, this is great. It's never the same as when you walk in the door. When we walked in, it was yeah. like, remember the kids when they, for the old Willy Wonka movie, when the kids first walk into the chocolate factory, that look on their face, that's how I felt walking in here. <laughs> Serious wow factor. Yeah, definitely. This so I'm is glad great. we're filming here today. It's yeah, a great place. very cool. I read that you were, you had, and I don't know if you were the subject of, or a guest appearance, or what the capacity was of you being on Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. So I want to know, did you go on to get a makeover? Did you go on to consult? What was that episode about? Uh, unfortunately, it was just that the artist I was working with at the time got, um, I guess someone who was on the show yeah. ended up going to a concert, and we were the band at the concert. Oh, OK. So unfortunately, gotcha. I can't say that I was like, there was no dialogue or anything okay. involved. But yes, I. Um, you know, they did an episode where this person came to a, it was Vince Neil from Motley Crue, who I was okay. playing with, and, and it happened in New Jersey. And, uh, okay. you know, those things, sometimes those cool things, you don't know that they're happening at the time. But, you right. know, I think we got told during the day, uh, hey, the you know, film crew's coming down to film something and blah, okay. blah, blah. And then, and then I realized later what's going on is, oh, okay, there's some, some TV show yeah. stuff. But a few of those cool things have happened. Like, um, I have also done a few of the... Um, Gene Simmons Family Jewels episodes. Right, right. Where I've had a chance to play with either, you know, my um, fellow bandmate Bruce Kulik Bruce, on yep. the show or, or um, got to do a little bit with Gene Simmons' son, Nick. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, it was just by by doing some some session stuff that it turned into, oh, now we're going to go and, you know, it's going to be on TV as well. Yeah. So, so that's, that's kind of cool. Cool. So who wants to geek out on gear? You want to geek out on gear? Because when I posted a picture of your kid a few days ago on our Facebook page, it was the picture of you leaping over this kit, basically. And one of the first comments someone put was, whoa, I did know DW made clear drums. Yeah. So what's the story on your kit? And we'll cut in some footage while you're talking about it. So um, this kit is a hybrid um, in the sense that the shells are from RCI. Okay. And the drums are, everything is put together to DW specs. Got it. So yes, they don't make, um, you know, uh, it's not part of their shells. line, right? No, I mean they're they're definitely a, a wood drum manufacturer, yeah. and you know if there's something in the future changes or whatever. Well, there's a concrete drum that John Good showed me recently. Yeah, yeah, it's Did awesome. Did you see that? It makes perfect sense because the harder a drum surface is, the more it's going to resonate, the louder it's going to be, yep. the more sound integrity it has. So concrete, how do you beat that, you know? Here's the thing about this drums, though, is, is I don't have the, uh, the acrylic kit um, other than the fact that it's a live visual that I was looking for on this mm -hmm. last tour. And okay. it's, I have a, it's a one-off drum kit, and I, um, you know, of course, John Bonham back in the day having those Vista-like kits yeah. was really cool. And we sort of, on our last Slash record, had done everything on two-inch analog tape. Cool. And a lot of the recording was done in a very 
sort of like classic retro, I guess it's retro now, uh, approach to recording. Did you do a lot of the tracks live and then just overdub All of it. the, that yeah. is so cool. A lot That's of it's, the way to record rock. It was it so fun and, and I think it just translated the best. And um, it's really hard to do because there's a lot of pre-production involved in getting you know, those songs worked up so that we could play them live and not a lot of punching in and, and cut and pasting. So, mm -hmm. you know, we kept a lot of the takes the way they were. But having said that, the vibe was a bit of a throwback. So I kind of felt this was, a, this was my version of a throwback. Yeah. And, I, and, you know, the it's DW guys beautiful. were really cool with, you know, facilitating that and, and being able to put the kit together. But it was sort of a thing where, you know, I have several awesome... Um, you know, maple kits, and I just recorded the new uh, record with the maple mahogany kit, which is my new Ooh. favorite. Love it. DW, maple mahogany, and uh, so I would take that kit on the road next. The mm -hmm. only thing is, again, for the live visual, this is a 28 inch kick drum. Yeah. And I'll tell you why I have a 28 inch kick drum is Abe Laboriel Jr. I went to see Paul McCartney years ago yeah. at uh, Staples, Staples Center in mm -hmm. LA. And I was just blown away because the drums were so big, yeah. yet he was so musical. And, yeah. you know, Ringo had a lot smaller drums. So just in my mind, I was putting those two things together. And I was like, man, Abe's just got such a great musical feel. And the drums sounded so musical in context. So I called DW the next day and I asked them nicely. I'm like, hey, what, what sizes were that kit? And they told me it's a 28. And I was like, order it. I want that. Yeah. I wanted pretty much the similar vibe. So, right. so big kick oh, drum. Cool. And the only thing is the maple mahoganies don't come in anything other than a 24 size. Mm -hmm. So it's my go-to recording kit now. But for a live, you know, visual aspect, I just yeah. wanted a bigger kick drum. So That's all cool. my live kits have been 28-inch kick drums. Right. And they're, they're really hard to play. To get used really? to that at first, yeah. That's a lot of drum. That's a lot of air to move. Yeah. But, uh, so. You know, I have, my kick is a 24, and it's a 79 um, Tama Imperial Star. And in 1980... Three, I think it was, I mixed my own color paint and I had a guy who paints show cars paint him. Of course, me and my tech had to take everything apart, which was the biggest hassle in the world. Yeah. So much so that I said, when we put this BS back together, let's leave all the bottom heads off and leave the front head off of the, the kick drum. Yeah, cool. I haven't put a front head, but I don't even know where the rest of the hardware is. It's just open. I want to do that. Blah, it's, I love it. I want to have over a whole, and play my kit. You'll see. It's I think great. we should do that. I, I always liked when, you know, even though there's a certain feel of the drums when they don't have the bottom heads yeah. on them. But uh, I love it. And yeah. I'll tell you a secret. Well, it won't be a secret anymore. My heads are Remo pinstripes. They'll probably hate me for saying this. Sorry, Remo. Got a great relationship with them, but I got to say this. The heads on all my toms are about nine or 10 years old. They've been through all kinds of weather changes, used to live in Ventura by the ocean. We're out here in Vegas. They've been packed away for a while when I was in Australia. Just all these, they sound amazing. And I think part of it is the open head, the open bottoms, yeah. but they still sound like new drums. Now, right. I would probably put new heads on and go, oh yeah, I noticed the response. I mean, of course, but tone-wise and everything, they still sound great and they're like 10 years old. But who's gonna argue too? I know Phil Collins doesn't change his heads. And right. I've, I've actually, there was something going on in Vegas here a few years back where um, Genesis was doing a, a gig at, at Mandalay Bay and through mm -hmm. a friend of a friend, I got to go down and I got to check out Phil Collins, you know, famous Gretsch kit and yeah. all the heads were pitted and I was so fascinated I thought that was awesome because I, I assumed I'm like well if I hit these they're gonna have that brr, 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 right brr. the vibration of the pittedness yeah yeah and I just kind of looked at it like hmm okay and then Phil came up and played and it was the best thing I've ever heard yeah. so it's that's cool. partly how you hit the drum and that yeah. person's you know style it, it, would you agree that that concept Brent is almost like leaving the patina on cymbals you know how the aging sometimes affects the tone and this and that and maybe yeah and phil's heads were white correct were they all coated the, the ones i saw were clear oh they were clear okay yeah. and mine are clear of course as well yeah and they they just sound great even though they're old i don't understand it but i've not been motivated to change them not for the sake of being frugal or cheap but the they mojo. just sound good yeah. i know it's how you hit them it's just getting used to them sometimes i hate taking a snare head off it just sounds sweet and you're like oh, i gotta change this because yeah. sometimes it might break or you know if it's right. live and you're just like nah, I better change yeah. that head but what heads do you have on the kit I have well this kits clear heads because mm -hmm. um, I mean it looks cool too everything's clear yeah. a, a white head on the snare is always it, is it I, coated yeah what brand Emperor X okay all Remo love okay, the Remo's cool. I've always played the Remo's um, so the clear emperors on this has been my go-to but on the new uh, record I, I had those the new vintage emperors mm -hmm. and I think those are 
I'm in love with those now. Oh, I think really? they have just a certain something. I don't know if the attack is different or the you know a little bit warmer, but the blend with those maple mahoganies was mm -hmm. was the winning factor. So yeah. so I'm loving you know and and clear clear emperors vintage emperors, and uh, I like coated heads too. I think sometimes you just stumble onto something and then you're you're like this is my new go-to and I, yeah. I think it's okay to experiment you know I try yeah, different definitely. snare heads and yeah. then I have my 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 go-to's like the Emperor X always seems to work it's a solid head that you know I use big, you know bigger drums and I like to hit hard so mm -hmm. that's gonna last and and still sound good after yeah. you know either a show or two or a couple couple songs in the studio but uh, you know I'm, I'm always experimenting but yeah that's so that's cool. that's what I've been using lately and your Sabian guy Sabian, because um, check this out. When I was a kid, I think I had like the first Sabians in my hometown. Really? There was a lot of like there was a drum store called Drums Unlimited. This would be like 1979, 80, and uh, I got my first drum kit. And I I went down to the the only local, you know, dedicated drum store we had. And Sabian, I mean, I think they started in 80, 81. The company mm -hmm. up in Canada. And they're Canadian, yeah. Yeah, and I just remember like. Going to that store a bunch and and you know getting my my little sticks replaced or a couple different heads and that mm -hmm. and those Sabians were brand new back in the day and I literally have been playing the Sabian symbols since the day the company started. Oh, that's cool. So they are you know I have a, a I love the way they sound but I have a an affinity for them just because I've I've only played the Sabians from you know from day one and oh wow I've been with the company from I haven't been an endorser my whole life you know later on in my career I got a yeah. relationship with them but That's I feel cool. like I've endorsed the, the symbols my whole life and you know mm -hmm. what I mean by yeah, that just totally as a as a user as literally. a fan yeah. yeah you know obviously in interviewing folks for the show like you all the time and doing a ton of being involved in the post-production process and then revisiting the interview you know weeks or whatever later mm -hmm. I hear this part of the segment and my mind starts thinking oh yeah I want to try that I want to try that and then I'll watch another interview. oh no 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 I want to try that I want to try that I just was working on uh, we just finished um, Chad Sexton's interview awesome. and he was explaining how he went to on his toms the smooth white heads yeah. which are like a timbali head yeah. and that got me thinking because I love uh, he says it's a perfect attack for a band like he's in 311 with yeah. all all the different stuff going on, he can still punch through. And I love a nice snappy, punchy attack with a lot of melodicism, a lot of tone. As yeah. I mentioned, all my drums are open, so they breathe. Mm -hmm. So now I'm kind of thinking how that might sound on my kid. I've used those too. Have you? Yeah, they're super cool. On so, your wood drums? Yep, on a maple kit, I've had um, this, you're saying smooth white? Yeah. yeah I've just had yeah. like smooth emperors on the toms. And uh -huh. I, I don't know why, like sometimes just, um, feel wise like I, I have to have a head on my snare that has the feel even though I don't use brushes most of the time but you know like right. I have to have the coated head that feels when I'm again my comfort zones on yeah. that so the smooth whites were a little bit different you know uh, just because I was like well they look kind of you know different to me and then I was using to try the black um, smooth I guess the oh, suede's yeah. Yeah. and they actually sound really good oh, I had really? a suede Black Emperor X on my head, on my my snare on tour for a little while, and I was like, this this was my new favorite head. But it was just the smoothness of it was was different for me. But those yeah. those are cool heads, and I think you can crank them up pretty good too. Oh so, really? Yeah. Cool. Very cool. So before we play, which I'm looking forward to, I'll ask you. It's time for a Brent Fitz fun fact. I know that you're being Canadian. I figured he's got to be into hockey, and come to find out, you are into hockey. Yeah, of course. And um, you play often? I play enough to get some exercise, mm -hmm. and I Good. usually play here in Vegas on downtime. Right. But I think it's probably the most dangerous thing I could do for a musician in a yeah. career, like needing your hands and stuff. So. Right, and joints. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to break any bones, and I don't think I can... Um, control that getting on the ice although I I do my best to play I play with other musicians here a lot of the Celine Dion cast and crew are are regulars on the ice out here so I mean and, and we're Canadian and it's you know yes Canadians love hockey yeah. and but um, so I do it for the exercise I don't, I don't like to work out I don't like to go to the gym I kind of mm -hmm. feel like it I'm not I have to be doing something that feels like a I don't know when it's more sporty I, I'm not you're looking for more of an experience to get it done rather than a task it seems like right? it, exactly yeah so um, so it's good that I at least on downtime can can go out and play with other musicians and yeah. and uh, yeah and I'm you know of course I'm excited because Team Canada just won the uh, the Olympic hockey uh, thing so right and when I asked you about this um, the night we met 
I was saying, where is there to skate out here? Because I don't play hockey. I've never played hockey, but I've always loved to ice skate. Just I love a good leg workout. I run, I walk a lot, I hike and all that. And so you told me about this place that was uh, on the south side of town. And my wife and I were somewhere recently, and, and I think I was driving. I was like, oh, oh, that's the place Brent was telling me about. Let's go skating sometime. I was like, she's like, just stay focused on the road and let's go home. You know, like I just wanted to go and go skating. Yeah, so unfortunately, I can't remember the name of it, but I saw it. It was near Fort pa or Durango. And it's the, I, I think, Las Vegas Ice Center is what they yeah, call yeah, it. That's but there's it another rink. Um, in one of the casinos at Fiesta Casino. So, oh, okay. of course, That's in Vegas, there's me. a rink in or a, north of me, yeah. In a casino. Yeah, yeah. Who, who, where else would you put it? <laughs> but um, what's funny is, uh, as a kid growing up in, in a very cold city, Winnipeg, uh, Canada, we had little hockey rinks in every neighborhood. They were outdoor rinks. And that's, that was our, you know, very, that was the social place where everybody yeah. went to as kids. So, you know, he, moving to LA first, I know you grew up in LA and I moved to LA you know, for 10 years, 10 years ago, prior to that, I, you know, when I got there, I was like, where's the hockey? It's like, right. good luck. But yeah. I found hockey in LA too. And here we are in Vegas and it's like, to most people, it's like, you guys play hockey in Vegas, the desert, come on. Right. But yeah, it exists here and, yeah. and uh, it's getting more popular. So it's That's cool. cool. That's cool. Yeah. So being that we're in a toy store, um, we're going to play with a few toys. And what's cool about this is any chance you get, play with other drummers, whether it's percussion and percussion or drum kit and drum kit or like what we're going to do, drum kit and percussion, because it makes you kind of think differently. You know, I think when you play a drum duet or even in a drum circle or something, it just makes the brain think differently rather than when you're the only timekeeper in the band or something and you just kind of solo back and forth or something. It, I just think it makes you look at music structure and rhythm structure and drumming a little differently. And if you pay attention, there's always something you can take from an experience like that and then apply it to being beyond the kit or whatever it is you do with the musical outfit that you're playing, I think. And we've never played together. So. And we've never played together, yeah. So this will be kind of fun. He didn't even know I played drums. That's not true. <laughs> cool. So we're just going to. We're set. wearing the shoes for the <laughs> that start. That, that, that was right. That was my giveaway. <laughs> well, and the show is called Drum Talk TV. Right. <laughs> so we're just going to set up the cameras a little bit different. We'll be right back, right about.